Welcome, everyone. Here in Berlin, or wherever you might be tuning in from, on your webcams all over the globe, we are very excited and very proud to see all of you here, more than 3,500 registered participants, hundreds of you here in Berlin, and that means the world to us to see you here. Thanks so much for taking the time and the effort. My name is Claudia Brüninghaus. I'll be accompanying you as your conference moderator. So you'll be seeing a lot of me, but much more importantly, and starting now, you'll be seeing a lot of each other. And so I want to encourage you, wherever you find yourselves during this Global Solutions Summit, maybe in a chat room, maybe in one of the auditoriums, if, even if you're standing in line for coffee, look around you. I promise you, you'll see someone interesting to get in touch with, to share your thoughts and perspectives, and to discuss stuff. We're very proud to see this unique mixture here of policymakers, of academics, of NGO representatives, and of speakers for the civil society. And we really believe that's a unique chance as a stepping stone for the G7 and G20 and T7 and T20 decision-making processes to have you all here today. Before I hand over to your host, Dennis Snow, president of the Global Solutions Initiative, let me give you a few pieces of advice as your human signpost, so to say. We want to encourage you to install Talk. That's our communication platform on your mobile devices, or if you're online in the stream, you're probably already on the platform. So that's highly nice, because you can not only today see the program and all speakers and all participants, but also stay in contact beyond these summit days. The program combines hybrid task force and community sessions, and sadly, none of us can be in all of them at the same time, but we will do recordings and share them with you afterwards, so take it as a chance to create your own program. We know about your packed calendars and about the many time zones you are dialing in from, so I will take care that we are very rigid when it comes to timing. I need to ask your forgiveness already. Shall it be necessary that I interrupt you in your contributions or your panels? Um, because that's one of the more ingraceful tasks of this moderation job here. We are very serious about our code of conduct. Please find that on our website and also on the platform. And be aware that our colleagues on the chats will have a close eye on tone and on style of communications at all times. Should you be facing any technical problems, please turn to our technical hotline or also via the chat. We, will, we are always ready to help you. And one last thing. We regard none of you as a spectator here, neither here in Berlin nor online. So we expect you to actively participate. We want to make the best of the fact that you're here. We would like to see and read you on the chats. We would like to see your cameras activated in the video sessions. And we hope you ask whatever you want to know and you tell whatever you want to say. And now, without any more housemeistering, I will hand over to your host and president of the Global Solutions Initiative, Mr. Dennis Snower. Please take your spot. Welcome to the Global Solutions Summit. This summit is taking place at a dangerous, tumultuous time. With Russia's invasion of the Ukraine, we are entering a new world order. And we're not yet able to understand the features of this new world order, but one thing is certain. There's no inevitability about it. The features of this new order will be determined by the political, economic, and social decisions that are made today. These are momentous times and a momentous responsibility. The old order, the liberal world order, was based on three well-known pillars. First, that people are of equal dignity and worth. The second, that people should work together in pursuit of common interests. And the third, that such cooperation can best be achieved through the forces of economic integration 
arising from globalization, technological progress, and financialization. Now, the legitimacy of the first two pillars, equal human worth and common efforts for common problems, cannot be in doubt. And although the validity of the third pillar has been called into question by the social and environmental ills that have accompanied the forces of economic integration, there was always a widespread hope among policymakers that globalization, technological progress, and financialization could be humanized through co global collective action. And the Paris Climate Accord, the Sustainable Development Goals were beacons in this direction. Russia's unprovoked act of aggression in Ukraine shakes all three pillars of this world order. To work together in pursuit of common interests on the global level, as is done in the G20 and the G7, we need to strive for a multilateral order, a rules-based multilateral order that recognizes basic human rights, like the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And we need to maintain the international anti-war norm, making it inadmissible that national boundaries can be changed simply by the use of force. Russia's invasion of the Ukraine calls both the rules-based multilateral order and the international anti-war norm into question. The economic implications of this invasion the balkanization of finance and global value chains, the upending of energy, raw material, and food markets has pushed the forces of globalization and economic integration into reverse. The current geopolitical crisis comes on top of other major global crises, as we know, such as climate change, the ongoing COVID pandemic, along with many other threats, some ongoing, some waiting in the wings, such as biodiversity loss, financial instability, antimicrobial resistance, water, energy, and food insecurity, digital disruption, and much more. These crises, actual and potential, will not go away just because there happens to be a war in Ukraine. Now, the Global Solutions Summit takes place against this backdrop, and it's our mission to address these major global challenges by generating policy recommendations. And these global problem-solving efforts rest on two far-reaching insights. First is that economic prosperity is important, but it is a means to an end. And when it becomes decoupled from social and environmental prosperity, such as when GDP rises, but at the expense of social cohesion in the natural world, then it is time to focus on social and environmental prosperity and to recouple economic prosperity with it. And secondly, our global problems are the outcome of a systemic failure. A system built entirely on the primacy of self-interest. Businesses maximizing only profits. Consumers maximizing only their own utility. Politicians maximizing only votes. Uh, and acting only in the national self-interest. This does not lead to the solution of global problems such as climate change and pandemics nor does it automatically lead to world peace. Dealing with our global problems requires a different approach, promoting collective action in response to collective problems. Now, this is the first year in which the Global Solution Summit brings together think tank communities of the G20 and the G7. And in connecting the recommendations of the Think 20 and the Think 7, the Global Solutions Summit 
aims to contribute to the coherence and alignment of policy advice across these communities. Global, the Global Solutions Initiative is very honored to have the opportunity of working with the Indonesian Think20 team under the leadership of Professor Bangbang and Professor Jisman, together with the executive co-chairs, Dr. Jose and Professor Riatu. And the Global Solutions Initiative is very privileged to lead the Think7, together with the DIE, the German Development Institute, under the leadership of Professor Honig, working with Dr. Berger. And the Global Solutions Summit embeds these research-based endeavors in a multi-stakeholder forum. The summit attracts world leaders from politics, business, and civil society in recognition of the fact that systemic transformation requires the involvement of all relevant stakeholders. And by promoting a multi-stakeholder, multilateral dialogue on multilateral problems, with the aim, of course, of avoiding the danger that a conflict in one area infects global problem solving in other areas, the Global Solution Initiative aims to contribute ideas and recommendations for an inclusive and sustainable systemic transformation. And this systemic transformation calls for a paradigm shift in our understanding of how the activities of government, business, and civil society are all interconnected. It calls for a broader approach to the measurement of prosperity, to reporting and governance, particularly digital governance. Work on this paradigm shift, recently supported by a collaboration between the Global Solutions Initiative and the New Institute in Hamburg, is meant to generate ideas that help people tackle their collective challenges collectively. Throughout history, humans have addressed their collective challenges through value-driven narratives. And in this time of geopolitical conflict, we must take great care in the choice of our narratives. The dominant narratives that um, are, exist now about the Ukraine war, Putin's threat to the West and NATO's threat to Russia, they lead us to escalated conflict. Conflictual narratives define one's identity and opposition to others, depict us as victims of aggression and demonize the adversary, justifying acts of violence. Such narratives are the road to hell. And if we want to achieve a benign Anthropocene, it's essential to seek constructive narratives. Such narratives are never driven by grievance and vengeance. They're never even based on handouts or arms. Instead, constructive narratives rest on a spirit of mutual respect, empathy, perspective taking among equals. They adhere to the theme of this year's Global Solution Summit, which is listen to the world, promoting social well-being within planetary boundaries. In seeking constructive narratives for our new world order, we will, I firmly believe, need to retain the first two pillars of the existing order equal human worth and multilateral efforts for multilateral problems. But we will also need to reconfigure the third pillar, recognizing that there are many diverse paths towards global cooperation, arising from the existing diversity of cultures and religions associated with diverse paths towards social well-being. And while all people in the world require social solidarity, personal agency, material prosperity, and environmental sustainability, they differ in how these are to be achieved. And constructive narratives respect this diversity. And they recognize, beyond that, that such diversity is as important for global problem solving 
as biodiversity is for the health of our ecosystem. Constructive narratives do not guarantee a benign Anthropocene, but without them, a peaceful, inclusive, prosperous world is impossible to achieve. And keeping this important truth in mind and in the con is as important for the conduct of the Ukraine conflict as it is for addressing all our other global problems. And my wish to you is that each of you participating in the Global Solutions Summit make enlightened contributions and policy recommendations towards this end. Thank you very much. And it is now my big pleasure and honor to introduce Matthias Korman, the OECD Secretary General, who has um, been in office um, since June of last year. Uh, the OECD has always played a major role in new thinking about the rule-based multilateral order. And uh, the OECD Secretary General Corman um, has put economic recovery, climate change, tackling digital disruption uh, into the core of his mission. Um, Mr. Corman, we're delighted to welcome you to the Global Solution Summit and look forward to hearing what you have to say. Dennis, distinguished guests, uh, thank you for the opportunity to address you today. Uh, as has been said, uh, we are meeting at a challenging time for the world. Over the past two years, uh, the world has been dealing with the health crisis and the economic crisis it caused, and Russia's war against the people of Ukraine and the pain and suffering it continues to cause uh, have been deeply distressing for all of us to watch uh, unfold over the past five weeks, continue uh, to be deeply distressing. Uh, the OECD Council, uh, for its part, has condemned uh, Russia's large-scale aggression against Ukraine in the strongest uh, possible terms, and we have expressed uh, our strong solidarity with the people and the democratically elected government of Ukraine. Uh, this war is, first and foremost, a terrible, a massive humanitarian crisis inflicted on the people of Ukraine. Uh, however, uh, it is also, of course, a serious threat uh, to our rules by this international order and adds significant instability uh, to a global economy still recovering uh, from the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, at the beginning of 2022, uh, the recovery from COVID was certainly well underway. It was, yes, it was uneven across countries and sectors with remaining downside risks, including uh, continuing health risks. And there was uh, rising uh, inflation with an uh, inflationary pressure outlook but it seemed that the situation was returning to normal, at least a, a new normal. Global GDP had just surpassed pre-pandemic levels and was converging towards a level projected before the pandemic. And then everything changed with Russia's war against Ukraine. And the economic impact is being felt uh, in many different ways, uh, tightening energy and commodity supplies, driving prices up, uh, international trade and financial market disruptions, digital and security issues, and indeed, uh, uh, last but not least, the unfolding refugee crisis in Europe. To date, uh, well over three million people have already escaped uh, the war in Ukraine, with millions more likely to follow. Uh, Europe and other countries around the world will need to sustain a humanitarian support in the short term and work to integrate a large number of Ukrainian refugees over an extended period. The developing and emerging countries also face a humanitarian crisis. Uh, Russia and Ukraine together account for about a third of global wheat exports and are major producers of fertilizers. Concerns about a fall uh, in global exports as well as speculation have seen food prices soar in these countries, heightening the risks uh, of food insecurity and malnutrition. Furthermore, in response to Russia's aggression, many countries have introduced unprecedented sanctions. These aim to maximize pressure on Russia while causing minimal disruptions in the countries introducing them, but they will still have an impact on our economies. 
uh, we will need sensible near-term and longer-term actions. It's going to be essential that we keep markets open and operating freely in order to stabilize prices and ensure supplies arrive where they're most needed. And close coordination between governments and the private sector are going to be crucial to mitigate the impact of shocks on supply chains and to increase their resilience, including by reducing longer-term dependency on Russia, in particular for energy. Finally, we're still grappling with persistent structural challenges that predate the situation in Ukraine and indeed uh, even the COVID-19 crisis. Against this background, the multilateral cooperation is going to be so crucially important. Global challenges must be met with globally coordinated policies to pave the way for more sustainable, inclusive and resilient recovery. Uh, climate and environmental challenges remain an existential threat and current concerns for energy security and rising energy prices have been renewed, have given a renewed urgency for accelerating climate action and the energy transition. It will take years to reach net zero emissions and to reinforce energy security globally. Uh, in Glasgow last November, 80% of the world economy committed to net zero emissions by 2050. However, in the end, what will matter are outcomes and, and results, not just ambitions and commitments. So far, we have failed to deliver on those commitments that we've made in the past. So action will need to get underway in earnest now. The OECD stands very much ready to work with our members and partners in developing policy actions to achieve our climate targets and strengthen energy security. To be successful, climate action needs to be effective and fair. It needs to be effective in that jurisdictions must help reduce global emissions rather than just take measures that end up shifting emissions from one part of the world to other parts of the world. And it needs to be fair in that every country and region of the world must take an appropriate and proportionate share of the burden. The challenge lies in how to ensure these measures do not tilt the global level playing field while avoiding trade distortions and carbon leakage. For this reason, and building on our OECD G20 successes on tax, the OECD is uh, seeking to um, launch an inclusive framework on carbon mitigation to facilitate an appropriately ambitious, multilaterally agreed and better coordinated approach to the pricing of emissions and to carbon mitigation more generally. This initiative will assess and report on the effort, cost and impact achieved through various policy approaches, ranging from explicit to implicit carbon pricing, while aiming to help inform better decisions and over time to help shape a globally more coherent, better coordinated approach to climate action. Uh, without better coordination, it, we will not be able to meet the Paris objectives, nor would we be able to do so in a way that is effective and fair. Alignment and significant scaling up of resources and of sources of finance must also take place. Uh, clean energy investment in emerging and developing economies in particular will need to grow from about $150 billion US in 2020 to over $1 trillion US per annum by the end of the decade and to continue to grow in the following decades. The OECD is supporting international efforts, including at the G20 level, to mobilize all available sources of finance, including innovations such as blended finance, to meet or to help meet net zero uh, emissions goals in a way that optimizes available financial resources, manages market failures, leverages private investments, and is sensitive to national circumstances. While the green transition must be effective and fair on a global level, it must also be effective and fair within countries. Without good policies in place to support a just transition, the localized and sometimes concentrated job losses associated with decarbonization could derail the necessary public support for climate change policies. The successful transition of workers to green jobs will depend on providing more opportunities for upskilling and reskilling throughout working careers. This, together with reinforced social protections, will be critically important to prevent or cushion damaging disruptions to people's working lives. We also need to exploit digital technologies as we go green both to monitor and combat emissions and to provide new opportunities. 
Uh, to do so, we will need to reduce the digital divide, which remains persistent both within and between countries. In 2020, for example, OECD countries were three times more likely to be connected to high-speed broadband than the rest of the world, and at a rate of roughly three times higher than the global average. Uh, globally, one in three rural households does not have access to the internet at home, while one in four only have access to 2G or 3G networks. Uh, such disparities may slow the green transition, as well as the ability of people, firms and countries alike to participate in an increasingly global and increasingly digital economy and society. We must therefore invest in our citizens' digital skills and access to the necessary infrastructure. We need to ensure that training and reskilling efforts target those who need the most, where, whereas at present, workers whose jobs are at risk of automation are only half as likely to engage in adult learning than their peers in jobs at lower risk of automation. A workforce with better digital skills also means higher levels of skills within firms, which can help boost their technological absorption capacity, particularly for SMEs, fostering innovation and job creation. And finally, a digital inclusion will also need to consider data governance and tools for good digital citizenship across a range of issues, such as public services delivery, digital identity management, public and private sector cybersecurity, online safety and combating misinformation. The latter is particularly of concern today. But the world economy is navigating difficult waters with the pandemic and Russia's aggression in Ukraine, compounding the effect of pre-existing structural challenges. In this context, it is you know, so obvious that no national solution will be enough to tackle the magnitude of the challenges we face. Multilateral cooperation is going to be more important than ever. And global fora must demonstrate the kind of leadership they have shown in the past when during the oil shocks of the 1970s or during the 2008 financial crisis, they were able to rise uh, to the occasion. We need to do so again, and the OECD will continue to play its part uh, in supporting the global community uh, in securing the best possible outcomes. Thank you. Secretary General, thank you very much for those inspiring words. Um, look forward to being in touch with you uh, in the ongoing exchange concerning these big global problems. Thank you. Next, I would like to introduce great honor and privilege to introduce um, a long-term friend and very distinguished um, colleague who since February of this year has become a professor of economics again, I'm delighted to say, and who since um, 2011 um, was uh, chief economic advisor to Chancellor Merkel and uh, G20 and G7 Sherpa. Um, before that, he had a very distinguished um, career and mates at Bay, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, we are delighted to have him here and very much look forward to hear what you have to say. Um, Henrik, it's Henrik Reller. Henrik, delighted to have you. Yeah, thank you very much and thank you for that very nice and kind introduction, Dennis. I'm here just to welcome you. Uh, so I'll be very, very short, uh, having listened very carefully the, to the message Dennis has given. I want to welcome you to ESMT, which is a private business school, the leading one in Germany and one of the leading business schools in Europe. I used to be president of the school before I went to the chancellery. And I think if you look at some of these issues uh, which have been addressed, both by Matthias and by Dennis, I think the, the impact and the necessity of private initiative and private businesses are very much needed. So I think the role ESMT can play in all of that is how can we sort of create the incentives. If I think about climate change, the capital markets issue, health and pandemic, we we'll have some sessions on that during the global solutions. I think the focus of the private initiative uh, is very important. So I think this is why we're very happy to have you here. 
Uh, we started this, Dennis, it was your, uh, I think your idea, if I may say so, in 2017 during the Germany G20 presidency. I think you've met every year here at, uh, at ESMT. Uh, and I think this was one of the greatest initiatives which came out of the German president in 2017 and looking at the program over the next two years. I think this is one of the you know, great multilateral fora uh, in Europe, if not the world, and I think that I uh, want to thank you and your team for having done such a great initiative. Um, just one thought on multilateralism, which is of course something we've been discussing for many years in the G20 and the G7 and also at the Global Solutions Summit. I think this has been a challenge in the last few years, but I think the invasion and the brutal war in the Ukraine, even though there have been other wars, notably Syria, um, have sort of put this at an order of magnitude higher. And I think that this summit comes at a great time. I think that a new world order is being defined. Uh, but I think message number one, which might want to come out if I have to say it, that we should not forget, as you have said, these other issues which we still have, and they're related which are you know, the, the supply chain issues more on the economic side, but especially climate uh, and the pandemic. Uh, and these are things which we should not forget, even though uh, I think that, um, that uh, you know, at the forefront and be very interested to listening to the chancellor today and other ministers is of course the war in Ukraine. I think the reaction by the West has been very, very good. Um, it's not, and it is in fact, in many ways a paradigm shift Maybe not the one uh, you have in mind, but I think it is very much an appropriate response. Um, I think that if you think about the issue of paradigm shift, um, and this is of course important, there are sort of two schools of thought. One is we need a paradigm shift. Uh, the others mean that politics goes by little steps. And bringing these two things together, I think, is what research and global solutions should be doing because the world is going in steps, even though right now they're actually big steps, in particular also in my country. And I think bringing this together, I think, would be, would be very useful. Um, so I want to welcome you to ESMT. Uh, I wish you a very successful summit. Um, I think I could think of no better place, as Dennis has no better time to have the summit here in Germany. And I'm very much looking forward to listening to you over the next two, two days. Thank you very much.